Imagine this. Seasoned actors and improvisers gather around a table with microphones and play a role-playing game. But not Dungeons and Dragons. No, they play their own formats and systems, or ones where the rules are streamlined and easy to follow, much like an improv game. Now, imagine these games with all their zany jokes and character quirks and ridiculous encounters, but imagine them realized, embellished, fleshed out, activated, and brought to life so that you hear everything as it unfolded in the performers' heads. Sound intriguing, interesting, impossible even? Don't answer. Welcome to 20 Sided Stories, an improvised role-playing podcast. I'm Jessica. I'm Travis. I'm Emily. I'm David. And I'm Sage. And with immersive sound design and original music score and full ensemble casts of voice talent, we're going to take you into a variety of familiar worlds and genres, changing every season with an original story and brand new characters to meet, all woven together on the spot. It's the comedy of an improv podcast, but with a cohesive, complete story. Yeah, you can definitely what? not attack it. Up. Why? Beat it up. Why? It's because a bird. it's a, You gotta hurt You gotta this hurt animal. it so that you can capture it and it's yours. Is that what the plan is? You Enslave gotta catch them all. that oh animal. My God. It's the adventure of an actual play podcast, but you feel like you're right there with us. We don't have time. We have to get to the green chapel now. You idiots are traveling too slowly for adventuring. I have a five foot two man on my back at all times. Steph, get off of her back and do your own walking. One of your steps is like four of mine. Then you better get it up, haven't you? All right, fine. <laughs> You have to tell me if something's coming. I can't see over tree lines. Can somebody get him some stilts? <laughs> Make me some, wizard. I can't hear you down there. It's the polish of an audio drama, but not even we know what's going to happen next. Roll for power, Masha. <laughs> what is it? Polcarella. Yes! <laughs> An epic audio quest to tell the best story possible in every genre imaginable. Embark now on Spotify, Apple Podcasts, or your app of choice. I've always believed that all those romantic stories where you just made that special someone and the world just changes are just another capitalist scam. But... Our story is not one meant for Facebook walls or Twitter threads or big budget Yankee Hollywood movies. This way, when I find you, do you have records of all the times I thought of you? Isn't that romantic? <laughs> ah, Sion. I can't wait to kill you. Dear God, if I pray to you, would you like it? Is that what I need to do to see you again? It wouldn't be the first time that I'm on my knees for the interest. Shit. I look back at the rest of the objects and I can hear the voices inside me, inside my chest, my head, my stomach. Read me, touch me, lean in. When I stare at the cup, there is just silence. When I wrap my hands around it, I expect the wax to warm me, but it is lukewarm, it's pleasant. I lift it, and I drink it, drink, drink, drink. Dose after you. Find it wherever you listen to podcasts. Lamplight Radio Play is an anthology podcast adopting the short horror fiction of Lamplight Magazine. Our stories are spooky, unsettling, and a slow burn. And to show you what we're about, we present this two-minute short, A Talk with the Falling Girl.
Okay, this is an EVP. It's June 21st, 12.55 a.m. We're at the former site of the Oakdale Mansion. This is an attempt at using Jamie's EMF booster. We're going to try to summon the apparition of what locals call the Fallen Girl. You guys ready? I'm ready. I'm ready. Here we go. We're running. Battery's at 95%. <laughs> you guys see that, right? Call the fire department. Did you call the fire department? Hello, there are people still in there. Call the fire department. Is she talking to us? Is that a cell phone? Not a phone. We need to get to a phone. Hey, hey, it's okay. Jamie, turn it off. The fire's over. It's all done. Everyone inside, where is everybody? Don't worry. It's over. You can calm down. Dude, turn it off! We're down to 40% already. What about Jake? Jake Haddon. He's really tall and he's skinny. He's got black hair tied in a ponytail. Look, I know it was scary, but everything's okay now. No. Jake was with me in the attic. The only way he could have gotten out is if, if he had jumped and you would have seen him. It's okay. It's all over now. 15%. It's a yes or no question. Was anyone else stuck in that house? Everybody's okay. Everybody made it out. Hey, are you okay? Yeah. She touched you, right? She touched you? She did. Oh, <laughs> holy crap! Oh, Jesus Christ. Did we, get, we got that. Oh my God, yeah, yeah, we got it. I don't know at what expense, but yeah, yeah, we got it. Oh, oh God, that poor girl. How long till we try again? <laughs> Never. Come Never, on. ever, ever. Come on. Lamplight radio play. Quiet horror. Unsettle your ears. Sure I can't get you a drink? Uh... I... Um... They'd had a moment, hadn't they? That afternoon when Garrett had smiled just like this. Warm-eyed and amused in a way that made Tony want another cigarette, but also want to step forward and... Hey, Kate, what are you writing? Ah! New text post on Thursday, May 21st. Title. Why you should be watching Selkirk. So, Selkirk fandom, who wants to read my 5,000-word essay, Garrett, last name, Secret Werewolf? I'm Kate, by the way. They kiss? I think I lucked out when I found Selkirk. Because if I'd loved something else, I would have made friends, and I would have been able to read a ton of great stories. But this way, I met you. Me and Day You, a new story about love and fandom from the Procyon Podcast Network. Hi, this is Alexander, one of the members of the team bringing you the PodTales programming you just listened to. PodTales is committed to free, accessible programming to explore and celebrate the art of creative fiction podcasting. This means our live panels are captioned and ASL interpreted, the episodes in our podcast feed have accessible transcripts, and all our programming is free. But in order to make all of that happen, we need support from fans, creators, and listeners like you. If you can, the best way to help PodTales grow is through a monthly contribution over on our Patreon page. Any amount that you can offer gets you year-round access to our Discord server, early access to episodes, updates from PodTales headquarters, and more. Check out the goals on the page for some cool plans we have coming soon. Head on over to patreon.com slash PodTales to make your contribution today. Help us keep PodTales free and accessible, and help us celebrate the incredible world of fiction podcasting. Again, that's patreon.com slash PodTales. Thank you. I saw a war coming. It's the Dead Eyes. Dead Eyes will never beat visionaries. That's how evolution works. It doesn't matter why I did it. You are standing here because of it. Me! This is my assignment. You work under me. Rebel against the Archseer. Stop saying what you can't and start doing what you can. I'm not running. If they rebel, we will win. Ash to flame! Flame to to ash! Visionaries, an audio drama, wherever you listen to podcasts.
I think. Yeah. It'll be great. Oh, most definitely. I mean, what is this? Once a year, we come together for celebration. We come together for discussion. We come together for her. What, el- what else do we come together for? Fun? Eh. Yeah. It's part of celebration, isn't it? Transfiguration? No. Um. <sighs> revision? Eh. Mm. Refinement, mm. a revolution, a uh, um, development, mm. exploration. Yes, exploration, exploration. Thank you. We come together for exploration. After all, we exist whether we like it or not, and we do not exist alone whether we like it or not. As big as the world is, it's still very small. Yes, the sea even more so. So vast and deep that to ponder its depths for too long is known to cause feelings of existential dread. What lies beneath? As vast as the ocean is, how vast and varied are those who call it home. Celebration, discussion, expiration, that's why we're here. The mermaid, beautiful and terrifying. That's why we're here. But to celebrate the mermaid, must we isolate them in the process? No, and I don't think anyone is asking you to. Yeah, but mermaids are why we're here. Yes, and they are here. Plus, I mean, it makes sense. They have lives. They do have lives. And in those lives, they exist. And they do not exist alone. So, yeah, it'll be great. Oh, most definitely. That was Dallas Wheatley as the reassuring friend and Sade Oyamakinwa as the worrier. Sound design by Chroma. Come on in, the water's fine. Season two, mermaids and other monsters. Four different episodes, four different conversations. Join us Wednesdays in May. Listen on Spotify, Radio Public, Podchaser, and many other wonderful podcatchers. We'll see you soon. Enter the Dreamnasium, a world of science and fiction without limits, where humanity has spread among the stars. Mama used to say the universe was a wheel, with Terra Primus at the center and alternate Terras spread along the spokes. Do you know, in my youth, I dreamed of this place. A place of stars above and below. A place of darkness and beauty. I have left your atmosphere. Proceeding to rendezvous point. You going to be able to handle this? On your own, I mean. Where mystery and intrigue meet. I've never had anyone look at me that way before. Like you recognize me. And I sort of feel the same, but we've never met. Hold on. We're tracking something. Target inbound at .58 Luminal. Think it's your friends? They're not my friends. They're not anyone's friends. This is Terra Nova 3, Bug. I wait too long, I stay open too long, I'm dead. Filled with denizens who delight and despair. You have got to be kidding me with these heels. And this body... Have you seen this? It's a little hard to miss, kid. Okay, so what do we know? He likes red? To wear, I mean, just red, neck to heel. We see you. Your life, your solitude must be crushing. Even for one such as you. Where just surviving can be a struggle. Faster than anyone I've ever seen. That's no, no. How how can that be? I just know I'm in danger. I've been followed, you see. Men in dark suits with dark cars. They're hurting me. Well, they're in for a shock. I don't get scared, I get cold inside. And then someone gets hurt. Pendant Productions proudly presents a new sci-fi anthology show, Jeffrey Thorne's Dreamnasium, on iTunes, Spotify, Google Play, Stitcher, and more, or download directly via PendantAudio.com. 
This is so exciting. Aren't you excited? It is a very promising development. down to I don't know where as we left the pitch black of the stairs we met a long corridor wide enough for wheeling parts to the elevator at the back the sound changed the street outside was muted we lost the creaking of the ceiling instead we could hear movement scratching of tiny nails scampering to hide away from a foreign noise we brought in breath and step and conversation in a place which had been silent for an age. Every room was dormant, the walls were concrete corner to corner, indents were left on the ground where once was something heavy, now empty. Except one. After getting our bearings, we found an old office with a cracked leather couch. This was our spot. So we stopped sat down, Luke pulled out two bottles, and we toasted to our closed-down ghost town. Folks, have you seen? Podtails is committed to free, accessible programming to explore and celebrate the art of creative audio fiction. That means our live panels are captioned and ASL interpreted. The episodes in our podcast feed have accessible transcripts, and all our programming is free. Free! free. But in order to make all that happen, we need support from fans, from creators, from listeners like you. If you can, the best way to help Podtails grow is through a monthly contribution over on our Patreon page. Any amount that you can offer gives you year-round access to our Discord server, early access to episodes, and more. We have some really exciting things planned. Head on over to patreon.com slash podtails to make your contribution today. Help us keep Podtails free and accessible and help us celebrate the incredible world of audio fiction. Again, that's patreon.com slash podtails. Thanks. What is that? One hundred years after Dorothy's adventures, two cousins are swept from Kansas to a mysterious land. Allow me to welcome you to the land of Oz. Oz? Full of strange and wondrous people. Call me Polina. I'm tired of living on the streets. I will not tolerate any rule breaking from you. But they can't forget what they left behind. My mom is the only person I have in the whole world right now. Right before I ended up here, she and I got into a big fight. I can't let that be the last time I spoke to her. And their new companions have troubles of their own. Am I to stay up here and rot in a city full of Tinker Toys that will break and have no one here to fix them? This is the fourth school I've been to in a year. I keep having to switch so no one catches on that I'm a witch. Jessica, you are not the only one with family to get back to. Many trials lay in their path. Beware the wheelers? What's a wheeler? (laughs) <laughs> what makes it forbidden? I don't want to find out! Go left! And the way ahead is not always clear. Don't you hammerheads get it yet? The wizard is gone. Glinda is gone. There's nobody left in Oz who can help you, and probably no one who wants to. But hope is not lost. There's no time to lose. It's very important that you get to Emerald City and ask for Ozma's help. How do we start for Emerald City? Why the same way people have done it for hundreds of years. Hit the bricks. Hit the bricks is a radio play set in the land of Oz. Subscribe at a podcatcher near you and follow us on twitter.com at hitthebrickspod. Transcripts are available at hitthebricks.com. Really nothing to it. All you gotta do is hit the bricks. I know that you can't do it. Hit the bricks. Who will you find on the Chimera? Hey, uh light-eating 
Space monster. A seven-foot-tall heretical catman. The human hacker, gadgeteer, and technophile. A galactic lawyer from the wrong side of the Akashic bleed. A living financial instrument. Sort of like a, a rhino centaur, almost. Hamster people. Right? Chinchilla people. Chinchilla, Chinchilla people. people. The bog witch of Zed. The honorable Lord Mayor. A bright red mustachioed land manatee. Technical or werewolf guys. Janelle Monet. Yeah, she's Janelle Monet. Exactly. This is the halfling Janelle Monet. The Chimera. Unexpected characters in unlikely situations. This is Just Press Playhouse. Why the watch now, son? We'll help you defeat him. You can't keep me away from him. I am Animal Caracas. I am more powerful than you can possibly imagine. Stay away from our son, you bastard. No, impossible. Where is this power coming from? It's not supposed to be this way. The sunstone is mine. This is the power of love. You're out of time, Caracas. You can't get rid of me forever. I'll find a way back to your dimension. I'll be back for you. Me and my watch will be here waiting. Ah, The light, it's tearing me apart. Go home and let me sleep. Not on Cuba, Yara. But Carmelita, she's so sad. Abuelo said they canceled Christmas this year. What? Christmas is canceled? Who says? Abuelo. You don't think Santa wouldn't do that, would he? All I know is Santa needs light to show him the way to all the boys and girls on Christmas Day. And if there ain't no luces, not even a spark, then Christmas in Borinquen will be sad and dark. I'm sorry, I was curious. Here, take the doubloon back. It's too late. Because you took the kiss and the coin, you are now cursed for the rest of your days. You will never experience love again. And wherever you go, people will revile you, spit at you. They'll want to hurt you, and you shall have to do unspeakable things to survive. The only way to remove the curse is to throw your coin into this well. Good luck finding it again. And just like that, she was gone. Yo! I was listening by the doorway the whole time, girl. That was badass. You told him where to stick it. I think I'm gonna throw up. That's just the adrenaline. I feel the same way every time I'm on stage. I've been on stage plenty, remember? And you will again, which is why I made you these. Um, what is it? Ballet shoe balloons. To remind you to keep dancing. Keep chasing your dreams. Thanks, Finn. You chase your dreams down, too. Where are they, Pop? Where does he keep them? (gasps) There will be great tribulation unmatched. Oh, sorry. Welcome to Podtails 2020. I'm Bob Ramonda, one of the organizers of Podtails. We're so excited to be putting on programming devoted exclusively to imaginative audio storytelling throughout the month of November. Today, we'll be treating you to the panel, The Role of Music and Storytelling. Thank you so much for joining us. At the top of this program, we would like to offer a land acknowledgement a statement that pays respects to the indigenous people who live here and who had their land stolen from them by colonizers. It is only the very first barest step in what we can do to support indigenous people today. The following acknowledgement of what we keep in mind, the following acknowledgement of what to keep in mind as we participate in this digital space is written by Adrian Wong of Spiderweb. Since our activities are shared digitally to the internet, let's also take a moment to consider the legacy of colonization embedded within the technology, structures, and ways of thinking we use every day. We are using equipment and high-speed internet not available in many indigenous communities. Even the technologies that are central to much of the art we make leave significant carbon footprints contributing to changing climates that disproportionately affect indigenous peoples worldwide. 
I invite you to join us in acknowledging all this, as well as our shared responsibility to make good of this time and for each of us to consider our roles in reconciliation, decolonization, and allyship. Next, I would like to thank our sponsors, Sarah Lawrence College in the Sarahs, Fool and Scholar Productions, Fable and Folly, Sleep With Me, Dagaz Media, and Winter Hill Brewing Company. These are major contributors who helped sustain PodTales 2020 and allowed our show to continue virtually this year. Learn more on our website sponsor page. PodTales 2020 is completely free. We believe in making the resources we're creating available and accessible to all. If you like what we're doing here and you have the means, please consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash podtails. ASL interpretation for this session will be provided by Brandon C. Kazen Maddox of Body Language Productions. Learn more about Brandon's work at brandonkazen-maddox.com. Please feel free to use the chat feature here on YouTube to say hello and ask a question of our panelists today. I'll be keeping an eye on the conversation. We'll pose a few of these questions to the group before the end of the hour. Without further ado, I'd like to introduce Elena Fernandez Collins, a podcast critic and forensic sociolinguist living in Portland, Oregon. She hosts the podcast Radio Drama Revival, writes about podcasts for her own website, The Bellow Collective, The AV Club, Discover Pods, and curates her own newsletter, Audio Dramatic. You can find her spending too much time on Twitter at Showmark, where she would probably like to talk to you about marketing, equity and justice, and reading way too many sci-fi and fantasy books. Take it away, Elena. Thank you so much, Bob. And welcome to another panel here at PodTales 2020, everyone. Um, I'd like to introduce Raul Vega. Uh, Raul Vega is a Los Angeles-based composer, sample developer, and audio editor. For over eight years, he's been working on film scores as a digital instrument builder for legendary composer Hans Zimmer. He has crafted the musical tools used to create scores for films such as Dunkirk, Blade Runner 2049, Interstellar, Man of Steel, Dark Phoenix, and the reimagination of Disney's Lion King in 2019. When he's not making cool instruments for film music, he creates scripted audio fiction podcast for his multimedia production company, Phantom Ape. His first one, Rose Drive, landed a mention in Forbes, in Forbes as one of the top 10 best podcasts of 2018. With Swiss and Lolly Hijack Hollywood, his belief is that you can have all the quality and immersion of a TV show in an audio only medium. The best part about what he does is getting to create visuals using only sound persuading his listeners to use their imagination to fill in the blanks. After all, imagination is the root of all storytelling. What's the fun of having it if you never get to use it? So uh, welcome uh, to this interview, Raul. We're really excited to have you to Thank talk you. about music and storytelling. Thank um, you so much for having me. It's an honor, truly. Absolutely. So let's Let's roll right into this, right? Let's talk about music in a broader sense. So music can fulfill many purposes in storytelling. It can be an assistive device that underscores emotion. It can be explanatory for the scene. It can fill out a story into three dimensions. And there's a lot of discussion and published thought into whether music should be explanatory or assistive. So what are your thoughts on this and what kinds of purposes do you focus on for your own work? Um, wow, it's getting right into it for me exposing my biggest bias is that music is everything. <laughs> um, you know, I think, I think the first thing I always question within myself, uh, whenever I'm writing something or listening to music, whether it's for film or theater or for, um, uh, you know, uh, musical or, well, I guess less musical because that's kind of weak into the fabric of it, isn't it? Is, is do we need music? Is there a reason for it? Now that's crazy because of course I'm like, everything needs music. Music is everything and everything is music. Um, but I, I, I think there are, there's certain advantages to treating them both with respect and accordance to what your story is. Uh, it took me a very long time to realize as a composer uh, what the role of a composer is. 
um, for the longest time, I thought as a composer for film, for example, you write the music that just supports what's happening on screen. And a lot of people view it that way. But after years of experience working more on that and just scoring music, uh, scoring movies myself and now podcasts, uh, the role of a composer is quite simply to be a storyteller. And you're not going to find a more interesting storyteller, I believe, than a composer because there's a language that is completely pulled from the soul of empathy in a way that we have to try to translate and connect with humans and people all over the place. Um, so, so I think when it comes to having it be more in the foreground or in the background, should it be, should it explain things versus kind of, kind of dip in the back? Um, I, I think the real question is, is, is asking how it's helping to convey the overall story of what you're listening to in an audio context, or even just in, in music in general, right? Um, it's, you know, without getting too much into the world, I mean, we have so many different periods and eras of music, and they all had their own purpose, all starting from religion to 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 the to uh, more structured, and then to more of a chaotic, and then a free chaos like the Romantic era, and then <laughs> contemporary music, 20th century during during the World Wars, which were all very I see and atonal, and and you know. Um, and then towards the later part of the 20th century, where so much of it was just experimental and, 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 and almost mathematic and scientific in a way of let's really break down what music is and what can be music, uh, which of course shaped the landscape of everything. Um, so I, I, I think overall, um, it's, it's, it's value and purpose is obviously what I breathe uh, every single day. Everything, like I said before, is music to me. Um, and, and I think to answer that question, it really just depends on kind of what, what the purpose of music is serving and whatever the narrative is that you're trying to tell. Um, Absolutely. Right. <laughs> um, no, this is, this is a great answer, right? Because it, it shows that um, when you bring on a composer or if you're a composer yourself, you're going to be approaching um, music and music in your narrative in in different ways and maybe even you should think about how you can have it be explanatory and assistive right doing those combinations of things because it might be different for different parts of your story right. so let's dig deeper um here into some of the aspects of composition right sure. um we love a good leitmotif in this house <laughs> right, a musical phrase that can be harmonic or melodic, and it represents a character or an idea. If you're thinking about Star Wars characters right now, you've got it in one. <laughs> um, so, Raul, what's the place of motifs in storytelling? What are they best at doing? And how can someone go about starting to build motifs into their scoring or music choices? Uh so I, I look at a uh, leitmotif kind of as, as an aspect of a theme, right? It's not quite necessarily the full melody. It's usually like a fragment of it, something that, that uh, we can come back to that is somewhat of a recall to what our overall theme is of it. Now, obviously, things have uh, time has evolved. Things have changed in, in a lot of film and even old radio dramas of where every time Jason comes on screen, you hear Jason's theme and da -da 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 -da. and and you know Jason's happy. So now we hear happy Jason. Jason said we're going to hear really sad Jason. Um, and, and while this style of writing music, uh, of, of approaching music and storytelling, has shifted quite a bit, I think for the better. Um, what what a motif really functions as to me when I'm writing is truly just the tools and the puzzle pieces that I can take and or rather my Lego blocks that I can then continue to build whatever structure I need to outside of those three or four or five notes, whatever it is. Um, I, I think someone like Michael Giacchino, John Williams, even Hans Zimmer are very, very brilliant at taking a little fragment of an idea. James Horner even said, coming up with the, with the motif isn't the hard part. It's surrounding it, everything around it that gives it the support um, to, to keep it interesting, not repetitive. Um, and, and there's a lot of things I think musically you can do to, to nurture it without it just beating you over the head with the same, same tone over and over and over again. Um, it, it, it acts as a foreshadowing device sometimes. Uh, hopefully in a very subtle way, you know, I think the best scores um, uh, tend to not necessarily stand out in the way where it's going to distract from everything, but it supports the story in a way the story would not be complete without it. And when you have a motif, um, you can take this really simplistic fragmented idea and just expand, contract, you know, go big, go small. 
Um, and it, it really is almost kind of like this grounding state that we can always kind of call back upon, whether it's conscious or sub or something more subconscious, really subtle. Um, and when you're developing it, it, it sounds so cheesy, but it's kind of one of those things where you don't really pick the motif that picks you because it'll get stuck in your head. And as a composer, it's going to drive you crazy, but it kind of has to, right? It kind of, it kind of has to live with you in a way where it's so, uh, it, it's so connected and grounded with the framework of what you're writing in, um, that, that you get to take this little blob of Play-Doh and mold it into whatever you want. Um, so it can be used, like I said, as a foreshadowing device. It can be used quite literally, as we said before, is every time we hear this character, we hear this instrument or this this little this little tune that's coming in. Um, um, it can be very much be used for comedic purposes, which we'll talk about a little bit later, how I use it, how it's used with my composer for Swiss and Lolly. That whole thing was built off of these these three little little motifs in this full theme and these building blocks we then later expanded on um, to 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 keep our audience um, kind of in on the secret, I guess you would say. Because um, if you're just changing every two seconds, you don't have any sort of foundation to kind of call back on. Um, so, I, you know, they're, they're, they're meant to be catchy. They're meant to kind of stick in your head a little bit. Um, and, and these little fragments, these little shards of, of ideas, when you really start playing with them, some really interesting stuff can happen. Um, I find them most useful when you're developing a suite, which is just kind of this long form bit of music that has several different thematic pieces into it, right? Several different melodies, could be five minutes, could be five hours, uh, but but the, the motifs can kind of help you stay a little bit grounded. You can spread your wings and fly, but you still have to see, you know, an area to land, and that's kind of where the motif uh, lives and, and breathes with me. It kind of just, it finds its way into your, into your tune. Um, Absolutely. I'm sure this is sounding familiar to a lot of the people who focus um, on writing art there who aren't composers, right? Because we have motifs in writing, right? We have um, aspects that we ground our storytelling in and, and call back to, right? Callbacks are super important in making a good resolutions in fiction, right? Something satisfactory um, and building conflict as well. Um, so, okay. So we... We love a leitmotif, yeah. but as you mentioned, um, they're not the only way to convey ideas and character. And personally, I don't think that we should be overly reliant on them because they're just these fragments, right? Mm -hmm. And they need some help to be truly effective. So that means tension and atmosphere. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so you've made a darkly dramatic podcast, which is Rose Drive, and a very tongue firmly in cheek uh, comedy. Uh, Swiss and Lolly hijack Hollywood. So first, what musical methods do you find are successful at conveying these two different types of tension, right? The comedic tension and the dramatic one. Sure. Um, well, I, I should probably start by saying what's been fun about these two projects is Rose Drive, I wrote up until the finale, all the music, everything from the first chunk of the season was all my material. So it was my music on top of my show creation. With Swiss and Lolly, I brought in composer Hannah Parrott, um, who is just, I mean, the talent that she possesses in her body is, is sinful. It's incredible. She's absolutely amazing. Uh, and we had a very long discussion as far as what we wanted the music to sound like for Swiss and Lolly. And, and, and in lieu of going with different um, different playlists as we put together and film scores, you know, of, 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 of just classic rom-coms, which is kind of a fun place to start. Um, the, the two different methods of approaching music um, could not have been more different. You know, with Rose Drive, it was very atmospheric. There's a lot of sound design elements. There's a lot of human elements that I recorded that went into the overall tone of the show. In other words, it was less about um, about motif and, and really theme where you're going to hear Marcus's theme every single time and really more about a feeling. And that was kind of the approach we wanted to take with Rose Drive was let's, let's, let's try to communicate what this character is feeling from his past and his present and even allude to a little bit of his future with these textures, especially when you're thinking about the way that Marcus views himself versus the way the rest of the world maybe views him. Um, and I tried to find musical ways of going about this you know one of the elements that i used in it was this propeller helicopter sound that i designed in my synth program that's just right 
um, to, to, to try to emulate what it is when he has these crazy headaches and the fact that his brain is constantly in this, this disjointed, broken loop. Um, and, and so for Marcus, or for Rose Drive, uh, it is very, very emotional. It's very, I mean, it's, it's kind of the notes of his soul, you know, of his demeanor. And, and I, I wanted to make sure that there wasn't, with him at least, there wasn't that much of a contrast between how he's viewing things, how he's feeling, kind of the way he looks at the world. The music is a very clear representation from Marcus's uh, perspective. Um, with Swiss and Lolly, <laughs> <laughs> Whole different can of worms. Uh, with yeah, I love listening to these two back to back and, and next to each other because they're just completely different. And, and we will be playing that um, oh, for the audience later. Yeah, with Swiss and Lolly, um, it's, it's, we really wanted to take this idea of just the majority of the show is just these two kind of bantering, right? These two, these two people who are just bantering about really a bunch of nonsense when it comes down to it. Um, and, and we wanted to make sure that the music kind of just mows it along with it. Like you're kind of going on a walk with them musically. Um, and so when I was talking to Hannah about it, like for, for Rose Drive, for example, there was a pretty much a fresh cue written for every scene, a fresh cue, cue as in a, a bit of music that's written. And, and, you know, we, I did variations of it, but I, I wanted, I kept most of the same instrumentation when I'm, you know, writing that score. Uh, but for Swiss and Lolly, we really wanted just these two or three little motifs or things that you hear. And, you know, then the challenge is if we keep playing this in every episode, it's going to get a little tiring. It's still funny, but it gets a little tiring. So we said, why don't we do this? Why don't, instead of Hannah writing these cues that we just loop, why don't we have con a, what I like to call a construction kit? Let's have our theme. Let's have our, our rhythmic section. Let's have our melodic section. Let's have all the support and the, the harmonies that are supporting it. And let's break those out into 14, 15, 20, 30 different instruments. And that way, what I can do later when I'm editing is I can take all these individual stems, these little individual groups of music, and rebuild these two little silly themes over and over. And, you know, I kind of look at it as like, you know, the Blaze Pizza or the Chipotle of scoring music where it's like over 50,000 creative ideas you can come up with, right? Like that's kind of <laughs> what we wanted to do here was let's take these two or three themes and rebuild them all the same context, like same content, same notes for the most part. But when you're just weaving stuff in and out, um, weaving in, uh, you know, sometimes it has marimba, sometimes it has celli, sometimes it has vibes, sometimes it's it's mouth percussion, sometimes it's hitting on bottles, all these little elements that you can kind of restructure it, um, it kind of adds to the comedic factor because our audience, like I said, is in on the secret and they know kind of what's going to come, but they don't necessarily know how it's going to come out. Um, and I think that kind of helps support some of the humor in it is not only just the placement and the timing of it, but the fact is like we all know this theme, but then it's coming in like at the moments where they're getting really crazy in their story then the theme comes out in a whistle, you know? And it's it's just two very different mindsets of kind of approaching music. One was definitely more raw emotion. Let's, let's, let's make the music a part of this character's um, essence and his aura, and we're supporting kind of his darkness and the trauma he's going through. And then for these two goofs over here with Swiss and Lolly, let's just write stuff that is uh, walking along with them, you know, just kind of like two little toadstools walking around. It's like, yep, okay. You know, they're kind of, it's kind of the musical representation of their worldview, which isn't quite that uh, highbrow. So. <laughs> um. You you mentioned this in uh, in a little in little parts of, of this really wonderful description, but let's be a little bit more specific for a moment. What can someone in the audience start training their ear for when playing a scored episode of a fiction podcast? Right when they're trying to like determine these kinds of meth methods. Sure. Um, so. I think what is what tends to be pretty helpful is um, when you start looking at music as not a storytelling device, but as just as ingrained within the story as the dialogue, as the sound design. And I, I always, whenever I'm listening to music or watching movies or, or listening to audio drama, 
Um, and the music comes in naturally, my ear gets really excited. But I'm trying to figure out what is the music trying to say that the creators uh, want emphasized under the action. I wonder what's happening. Um, because sometimes the, the, the contrast can be really, really, really cool. Um, especially when, when you kind of inherently hear that the music is telling you a story that's still within the context of the words, but maybe it's foreshadowing something a little bit. Maybe it's warning you a bit of what's to come. Um, my favorite thing is, is having music, especially if we're talking about a thriller or a mystery, you know, the placement of when it comes in, um, and especially under what character is speaking, the music can often tell us whether or not we should trust this character or trust these words. And it's something that is almost you can't even really articulate because it's so, um, unless it's really over the top, you know, like someone comes and they're like, ah, it's like, da, 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 you know, then obviously that's not, that's probably obvious that this character is not somebody you want to, uh, <laughs> probably not somebody you're, you're really going to trust. Like, okay, you're really telling us right now, let's not really trust every word this character saying. Um, but as as far as kind of, I, I don't I don't know if there's really a, a method that I can say that I use to train my ear to look out for these things. I think I've just listened to a lot of scores. I've watched a lot of movies, and and I've tried looking at the whole thing as one bit of story versus like, oh, here's the music part, here's the sound design, here's here's the dialogue, and and. I think a really good place to start, especially if we're not composers ourselves, right? Um, because naturally being a composer, being a sound designer, editing audio every single day of my life, my ear is very, very, very accustomed to sound and textures and just, you know, so naturally my ear is always doing work before my brain even like can have time to comprehend it, you know? Um, yeah, so it was just, I just honestly on a sidebar, that's why listening to music with heavy depth lyrics I have to really focus on because my ears are naturally growing towards the music and the textures and really more of what the singer is how they're shaping the sounds and the color of that versus what they're actually saying it's really difficult for me to actually sit down and say focus on the lyrics right uh, I've gone in a lot of fights with people because of this and I and trust me I, I don't blame them oh dear but, yeah <laughs> um but but anyways to 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 hopefully answer your question I think listen with intent, be an active listener. Um, try and listen to what the music is telling you. Sometimes it's very obvious. Sometimes it's a little bit more subtle, but take note of it. Take note of when those soft um, high strings kind of come in in most of these transitional things. I mean, a lot of what we do as composers, whether it's for, for audio drama or for film or whatever, is, is helping with transitions. You know, a lot of this, we're not gonna hit you over the head immediately with a really romantic theme if that's kind of what we're going after. Um, usually we want to kind of ease into it. So I think really just paying attention to when the music makes its entrance and especially when it makes its exit um, and kind of the conversation that it's trying to have with you as an audience member. Um, naturally, when we're listening to audio drama, the words kind of take precedent over everything. That's a story we want to be listening to. If that's the type of show that we're listening to. But, but trying to think of the music as language as well. You know, think of the music as the words uh, on your second listen through. And those will give you exact clues and identifiers as to what this, the, 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 the part of the story that's not necessarily being said by words, that's where the music can come in to really not only emphasize, but kind of translate a little bit more um, what that story is. Absolutely. I think that those are uh, great ideas. I think that more people should approach scored storytelling, understanding that they work together and they are not like, they're not two separate circles. It's a Venn diagram. Mm -hmm. um, <laughs> um, so uh, shortly we're going to play uh, two snippets. So these are going to be short scenes from both Rose Drive and Swiss and Lolly uh, in order to talk about emotions and musical technique. Why now? What business does he have here? It doesn't matter right now. I need to find him. And it looks like the best way to do that is by finding out who he was talking to at the reunion.
should be easy enough to find. second here, won't we? Queue up the next one. Well, I was only doing it because you told me to just be cool, man. Okay. You earned it. You're really slow copying right now. Well, okay. Congratulations! You've reached the pinnacle of coolness with that move. Ugh. Isn't that right, Buster yeah, Kitty great. Kitty? Those were our uh, two clips. Um, so, let's see here. Okay, so let's talk about the techniques that you are using in these two clips in order to depict and underscore emotion. Wow, um, <laughs> it's so funny that I, I kind of went to this dark, dramatic place in that, and for the pilot for Rose Drive and have that mark, it's like, oh wow, I remember all that. Starting to get a little bit of anxiety had when I was writing it, and then we go right back to these two. Yeah. Well. <laughs> <laughs> um, sure, so, so you know, as I kind of mentioned earlier, uh, that, that kind of repetitive piano that you hear and the clock ticks and the heartbeat of the propeller is really more conveying kind of Marcus's anxiety and, and his tension that's building within himself um, as far as uh, uh, just discovering that this person who essentially ruined his life 10 years ago is close by. Um, somebody he's thought about every single day and, and now he learns he might be here. Um, it, it's, it's playing up to the drama of what he's feeling in his head, but also as a means to help propel the scene forward. So it's not just a silent, let me take 20 minutes to walk out of the bar and then sit and type on my computer. Um, using it also as a transition um, uh, device um, and having these very specific song textures that I wanted to create a sense of discomfort and anxiety within our listener. Um, instead of it just having like a little piano theme, let's have these textures that, you know, if you if you listen to that on loop for five minutes, you're going to probably your heart rate's going to rise a little bit. I wanted to make sure that our listeners were empathizing with Marcus and feeling what he's feeling. Um, I, I, and a little <laughs> side note, I was we were knee deep in working on Dunkirk at this time. And if anybody's seen that, the whole movie was just the whole movie was very anxiety ridden and I was feeling really anxious during all of this. And I was like, I couldn't get those kind of textures out of my mind. So part, part of it was a slight nod to what I was currently experiencing in my professional life. I'm like, I'm going to bring these elements in here as well. Um, but just this, this kind of repetitive drone of this clock tick and, and the, these whirlwinds of the propeller kind of coming in and, and, you know, going up and down, raising up and down, that's your anxiety and your stress, your heart rate going up and down. Um, and and I, I thought that was um, kind of the only way to approach this, to really convey the anxiety and dread that he was feeling and frustration and, and anger, all of these dark feelings. Um, and I, I wanted to have our audience kind of feel that with him, kind of be in that mental state with him as well. Um, switching over to Swiss and Lolly, um, again, <laughs> this, is, this, is, this is the same theme we're hearing through episode one, two, three, um, uh, I don't think we hear it in four, but the first three, definitely, but in fragments and different um, kind of, as I said before, these construction kits. Um, but it it really was wanting to play at kind of the absurdity of like how they're just kind of jabbing each other, blaming each other for all of this. Um, and, and you know, even during the story, the whole story of Swiss and Lolly, you know, as much as they give each other crap, they still love each other. And this is this is kind of at this point that peak where like Lolly kind of gets a little angry at Swiss, Swiss gets a little angry at Lolly. But having this this jester, you know, comical kind of like circusy feeling uh, that just is playing into the absurdity of what just happened the episode before. And I'm not going to ruin it for anybody who wants to listen to the show, but it, I mean, it just gets so silly. Um, so I, I, I when I was talking to to Hannah about us making these themes. It, it was always something to support uh, more of 
the tone of the show versus their actual emotions, you know, um, and and that's kind of where those that little thing comes in throughout the entire series is it's just like that walking little tune, um, and and you know placement does a lot with it because we we intentionally made it a little bit more staccato as opposed to really like flourishing and growing out because we wanted to leave room for the dialogue to really deliver all the humor and and the music can just act as this you know little sidekick to these two characters you know um and, and so and so again it was just kind of taking still that same theme we're hearing because it's the same thing when they're in the car in episode two and a bunch of other stuff too where it's just you know it's something that you can just kind of like zone out to and really still stay focused on these two and their banter uh while having a goofy little tune playing underneath you know underneath them so so i would say the rose drive tune was significantly more uh attached to marcus's emotions and his feelings and his anxiety and his his darkness and all these feelings that in 10 years this is why he's avoided coming back to his hometown and now it's starting to manifest and it's starting to foreshadow you know um his headaches and all these all these face these things he's going to have to face pretty soon down the line um it, it was meant to create that sense of urgency um and and anxiety within the listener whereas swiss and lolly it was less about their feelings and more about us kind of eating popcorn and laughing really laughing at them and like you guys are so <laughs> silly you know um but both i think kind of equally important because there, there there was a very clear intention behind it you know we didn't want to score that scene to the dialogue i mean the dialogue in rose drive it's there, but there's there's slightly more action with him typing on the computer, and I wanted to to represent that musically. Whereas this, the music's very much meant to be more as an assistant, um, you know, uh, 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 that's just kind of there to to just be in the background, still still be noticeable enough, but but really just keep their little banter going back and forth. Um, so those were the approaches behind both of those scenes. And those are really interesting choices you, you made. <laughs> <Not> <laughs> <expecting those> ones. <laughs> I like to surprise you. I love um, it. Yeah. I, I, one of the things that came up for me when I was listening to the, um, to the Swiss and Lolly uh, clip that we just played is that sense of also like sarcasm. Um, yeah. <laughs> Right, because they're they're fighting. Um, right. and it's the first time that we've really seen them uh, like starting to go at each other, right? And this right. this is from episode five, um, and she starts to to slow clap at her mm -hmm. friend, uh, <laughs> which, <laughs> and while she's slow clapping, we we hear that really cheerful, upbeat, very snide tune, because um, it feels so cheery and wholesome, and yet. <laughs> <Right>. <laughs> Yeah, 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 it's 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 a very it's very clear. I'm glad you actually said because it, it, it is all rooted in that. It's all rooted in this sarcastic tone that they obviously give with each other. Most of the time, it's when they're delivering it about other people or other things, you know. But but here you kind of have them going at each other, and it's just it's just an eyebrow raise throughout the entire thing. Um, <laughs> yeah. Um. So let's let's talk let's talk more about different um music pieces that come up right so not everyone is going to have the resources to fully score their podcast sure. right but some might be able to hire someone to write a theme song mm -hmm. and of course we can select a theme song from places like free music archive sure. um so first we're gonna pull up two theme songs um we're gonna pull up the theme song that you composed for valence which is created by hug house and we're gonna pull up the theme song for swiss and lolly after that
Phantom Ape Productions presents... I love those theme songs, first of all. They're great. Uh, <laughs> I'm slightly biased because I act in valence, possibly, but no. Um, so now that we've we've listened to these two theme songs and so uh, so that you can refer back to them, right, um, what's the purpose and place of a theme song in your approach to audio storytelling? And what elements are you aiming for that others can listen to? Um, oh, wow. Uh... Always with the best questions, Ellie. Um, so sorry, not sorry. No, please, just it's. I was one of those very very nerdy kids that would be obsessed with listening to the main title of any movie, right? And and back when that was a thing, the opening credits, and there's a main title, the main theme that's playing over the opening credits, three minutes, three and a half minutes, tells you everything you need to know about the about the story, right? It's kind of like our overture, our modern day overture. Um, things have quite evolved since then to where a lot of television shows and movies may not necessarily use themes in that same context. Uh, but for, for both of these, uh, one thing I also do want to point out, this kind of it kind of closes off that third uh, element I wanted to talk about, where Rose Drive is writing a theme for my own series. Swiss and Lolly was having another composer come in to write music for my series. Um, or yeah, and then also Valence, where yeah, I was hired to write a theme for somebody else's story, uh, all with its different challenges. Um, but I, I, I'd like to start with Valence first. But definitely, first off, shout out to Travis Reeves for adding those really cool, uh, uh, very Tears for Fears guitars and elements, and 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 is it, it was it was really a lot of fun working and 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 taking the sonic texture that I had and wanting to bring in even more. I remember talking to Will and Anne and Katie. Um, about the whole concept of developing this thing. Um, I, what was really great about writing the theme for this was how much thought went into um, um, wanting a theme that had nothing to do with me, just speaking with the producers of Valence. I'm so diligent about having playlists and ideas and words and pictures and colors and, and, and to a composer that's everything because it tells us you care about this. You want music in this because you see it as more than just, oh crap, we have everything but the music. Let's just throw music in here at the end, you know. Um, and and we had long discussions about uh, what we were trying to emote with the theme and letting that be a foundation for the rest of the scoring. Which uh, I didn't I didn't do any of the scoring, but having it set the tone for what the show is, and that's essentially kind of what a theme should be if you're having an opening credits theme. What what can we give our audience clued in on just enough so they kind of know what world they're stepping into? You know, if you took the valence theme and put that in front of Swiss Somali and got Swiss Somali, you may be a little confused, or vice versa, right? Um, but 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 in this context, uh, you know, it challenged me because, and 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 Hug House can definitely attest to this. I tend to start as cheerful as I am. My music always starts really dark and really heavy. And the original Valence theme was more like, and this was an extended version, but the first part of it was pretty dark. And the main melodic part that comes in was originally much darker and more heavy. And, and everybody was so sweet saying, this is really cool. It's a little terrifying. Can we maybe pull back a little bit? <laughs> so, Got it, let's do it. Let's, uh, let's, let's, let's take a step back and kind of see how we can recontextualize this in a way that's gonna make sense for, for the show. But I essentially wrote, I think like a six, five, five or six minute suite based on on the environment, the setting, the characters, the emotional themes that we all discussed that I read. Um, and and uh, that gave me some sort of place to uh, empathetically start from writing. Um, texture, instrumentation, we definitely wanted more of this kind of grooving uh, uh, industrial music with a little bit of kind of like retro synth pop that kind of comes in 
Um, and then we hear that tears for fears things kind of come in that just kind of happen. And we're like, that's definitely how we made it a little bit more cheerful. <laughs> um, so, so, so the, and then of course the missing element, because I had all of this as synth work and all those were samples with the exception of the guitar in the beginning and the end, which is Travis Reeves. Uh, all of it was, was synth. And we wanted to make sure, I remember we were so close to, to being really happy with, it. and I said, hold on. We need a human element because we're not dealing with characters who are not. We were dealing with with real emotions and real feelings of things. Let's bring in that human element, and that's when we talk about. Well, I I, I know just the guitarist who lives right down the street from me. Uh, <laughs> in the before time when we were able to meet up in person and start, you know, kind of jamming out together. Right, uh, the olden days. The olden days. Right? Um, and so and so that's kind of what it came down to. But but well, this is a perfect example because speaking to Hug House. Um, we didn't speak in music terms. We didn't speak in anything technical. Um, it was all just people talking and talking about the story and hearing their very clear understanding of what they wanted and what they knew of what their characters and where the story was headed. Um, that gave me everything I needed to know to say, got it, I'm going to go on and try to, try to do this. And it, it still was, you know, for me, it was challenging. It was terrifying because I sent it off and all I cared was I hope this isn't, if this isn't um, sending the wrong message to to your show you know the com composer has a lot of power in that way to really dictate kind of what people are feeling um during during a series whether it's in the score and the theme itself and had we used the original one people would have thought they were stepping into the depths of hell you know <laughs> until we changed it and said let's 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 actually pull back and you know as cool as this sounds we we need to kind of kind of squish it down and kind of focus on who this is kind of following. And, and we decided it's going to be an overall uh, um, arc of the whole story that hopefully will translate, you know, for seasons and seasons to come. Uh, for Swiss and Lolly, when I was talking to Hannah Parrott about it, I, I you know, I, I originally was just like, think of the two goofiest little camp counselors you could ever think of in your life. And, you know, just, you know, scouts selling cookies, just, just, I, I want to see these two little like jaunty cartoon characters <laughs> that are just kind of like bopping their head along. And it, you know, the thing for Swiss and Lolly, it's just, it's so them, you know, it's just, it's quirky. It's silly. It's very uh, Andy Griffith, you know, kind of a callback to kind of that 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 world of, of sound and music we wanted to be fun definitely wanted to, to stick in people's heads that just hearing the theme you kind of can't help but laugh at it when you listen to it you already know this is going to be a ridiculous ride that you're in for and we wanted to hit them in the face with that from the very 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 beginning um and so you know it's they both set the tone uh for what the shows are going to be uh, but with Swiss and Lolly, it very much was, you know, while we are going to have some fun, crazy, wacky adventures that go on for the most part, this is, this, I kind of feel like the theme is what kind of just constantly plays inside of these two's heads all the time. Like, that's just kind of how they put pieces together. Um, and as you listen to the show, you know, uh, we break fourth wall and they start kind of picking up on that the theme's kind of happening. And it's, you know, that was another element we really wanted to play with was how can we take this funny little theme and just, you know, it, it kind of goes back to to those fragments, right? Because for the Halloween special, we just took that theme and just changed the instrumentation um, quite a bit and added all these cool little funny, like you know, little little quirks and sound effects to to take the theme that you already know and just put it put it in the wash and see what came out. Um, so, yeah, I, I I think I think what's really powerful about themes is really kind of setting the tone. And, and giving our audience something tangible to hold on to while they go on the adventure of, you know, uh, wherever they're headed, whatever uh, story they're going to be listening to. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Absolutely. So I, I'm going to have one last question here before we go to a Q&A. Sure. Um, so let's briefly touch on the values of diegetic and non-diegetic music, or in other words, uh, music playing that is actually playing in the setting and heard by the characters versus music that underscores action and is only heard by the audience. So what are your thoughts on mixing them together versus sticking strictly to one or the other? 
So uh, again, I think it kind of comes down to the context of the story for Swiss and Lolly, as we know, it is very fourth wall breaking. So you get both, you know, where, where the music the audience is hearing is also the same music that they're hearing. Perfect examples with the theme. And that's the beginning of every joke of the beginning is like, you hear that? Oh, I don't hear that. Either. Okay. I finally heard it that time. All right. I get it. You know, and, and especially in episode <laughs> five is, was kind of the fun one. You know, Lolly's waking up from her crazy diet and she's like, oh my God, I get it. Stop playing that music. Um, you know, and again, I think for us, it was really a way of really wanting to push forward and say, you know, let's 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 really have fun with this. So the world is so self-aware of itself, self-aware of itself. Do you like how articulate that was? The, the world that they're in is very self-aware. Um, and, uh, you know, it's it's while well, we do have pop tunes and stuff that are playing in it. Um, it still is a lot of the underscoring, like I said, in Swiss and Lolly kind of functions as just the music's kind of going on the walk with them. Um, and so I think for Swiss and Lolly, it, it functions well that way because it supports just the dialogue. And it's not so invasive. The music isn't the, the center of attention, but it is there to help kind of, you know, get a couple of those chuckles out. Um, when, when you're listening to Rose Drive, there's definitely a lot of times when they're listening to to music on the radio. This is obviously my way of also definitely wanting to prom promote some of my friends' amazing music that just worked with the show. Um, and and you know, I think it's I think it's in um, in Alina's episode in Rose Drive where the whole thing starts off in her story where she and her boyfriend are listening to music and and uh, you know they're making out and then he cranks it up. He's like, yeah, I produced this song and and uh, you know it was it's is part of their kind of narrative and their story. Um, yeah, I mean, I think kind of when it comes down to it, it really just does boil down to what is the purpose? What's the point of the music being played in the scene? Because as, as I said before, sometimes if it doesn't need music, then don't have music. Uh, but if you are going to use it, um, understand why you're using it, I think, above everything else. Is it acting to help the story along? Is it part of the story? Is it supporting the story? Um, and, and, you know, like I said, for Swiss and Lolly, it's kind of all of the above because it's all so mixed in with each other. Um, you know, we didn't quite have time to do this, but, and I may be ruining a, a joke for later, but in one of the scenes from Swiss and Lolly where it's this big chase scene because we're running out of time, we had an original version where they're running and the music kind of slows down and they're like, are we okay? And Lolly's like, I don't know, listen for the music. Okay, we're good. And then music kicks back in and like, oh crap, no, we're not okay. Um, you know, it's the <laughs> self-awareness that's just kind of a lot of fun. Um, but yeah, that's that's kind of my my approach into it is whenever I'm putting music in a scene, the first question I ask is, does it need music? And if it if I feel like it needs music, chances are there's something else that it needs before music. Chances are there's something I missed maybe in the edit or maybe in the dialogue or the sound design. I don't ever want to look at music as a band-aid. And I've worked on projects where we've had to do that before. Several movies, even at my studio, where we got three months before the movie came out and we had to kind of fix the project because the music wasn't doing enough to, to support what was happening on screen. We kind of came in as this rescue mission. like put the band-aids over this, you know, uh, which which doesn't really make it fun for us because then it makes it like, well, it, it's less about you telling the story and more about trying to fix the story that's having like, you know, putting a bunch of fingers and in, 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 in the holes of a boat that's just popping out more corks and while water keeps flashing out at you. Um, so so I think having a strong, clear intent, intention behind everything that you're scoring or putting music into is the absolute best place to start. Absolutely. And I actually want to highlight something that you said really briefly before we head to the Q&A, which is like, does it need music? Is it like silence is a key component in good audio storytelling, especially for doing things like building tension and pacing dialogue. Okay. So definitely, I think, and let me know if you agree, silence is a part of music. Oh, and yes. Yeah. Yeah. Yeah, without a doubt. And I don't even get into John Cage's four minutes and 33 seconds where he just comes out on stage, sits down in front of piano for four minutes and 33 seconds, gets a thousand walks off. You know, <laughs> silence is music and the power behind it is so, I mean, my goodness, it's its everything, especially when you notice that it's not there. There's a big scene in Rose Drive, which I don't want to reveal, where we have music throughout most of it. And there's a very intense scene that happens where I, where I very much uh, uh, thought, made sure there was no music here because we've had music playing throughout 
and I really wanted to make sure the emotions were just stuck with you and what these characters were going through. And even if even if we wrote the right music that that would have supported it, it would have been too much. Let's let the audience feel kind of the nakedness of no music, you know, especially when you have very score heavy shows like the ones I, I, I create. When you take that comfort away, it's interesting what it can kind of do to you as, as somebody who's digesting it. So, Absolutely. Okay, now we're going to bring Bob on to tell Great. us some questions that have been asked in the chat. Bob? Cool. Absolutely. We've got a couple here. Um, up first, speaking of a composer's language, what should a new audio drama creator know before attempting to communicate what they're looking for from their, from their composers? Is simpler language easier to work with? Oh, so let me give a little bit of a slight anecdote here. Uh, we were working on something at, uh, at my studio and we were working on these music cues for a library or for a um, for, for a network and we sent them a bunch of these library tracks and one of the executives gave a note of saying the mix is too over modulated it's an over modulated thing because they were trying to use music terms now as musicians there's two different ways we can interpret that modulating as in changing from one key to the next or as composers we actually have this thing called the mod wheel where you can modulate between two different sounds um, or you know dynamics or whatever and so we're running around like crazy, trying to figure out what the hell does this person mean? Don't overmodulate the mix. Are we changing keys too much? Are we are we having these long string patches that are going from like really prickly to really dark? Are we doing that too much? And it turned out by the end, after days of struggling, what they meant was that the music was like the mix was too hot. It was clipping, and so they tried to use a term that they thought they knew meant that because they were trying to communicate with us. And three days into it, we're just like just say it was too hot or just say like, you know, there's distortion or there's, I don't like the sound that happens at this moment. That would have saved a lot of time. Um, it's so imperative to just use language. Like I, I was saying before all this, we don't even talk in music terms. We don't talk about key signatures or any of that. We talk as people with our directors, with, with our composers, with everybody. It's all just talking and emotion and feeling. And I think as a creator, not only is it the safest place to start, but it's also going to give you so much more of an understanding of where your composer is coming at, because the composer has to be the 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 uh, empathizer with with representing the music and the story you're trying to tell. And I think starting with temp music is great to give an idea of what kind of textures and tones you're going for. It's definitely safer than trying to say don't over modulate the mix. Um, <laughs> I will tell you that much. Uh, but, but yeah, I mean, I think a lot of the intimidation comes from because especially if you're not a musical person, it's a very different language, uh, but it doesn't have to be, it doesn't have to be intimidating. I think just starting with, you know, with just raw words, even if it's just, this is happy or this is sad, it just explain kind of what's happening in the scene. Um, and your composer will know what to do with it and they'll give them a place to start. And when they pass it off, we can make adjustments accordingly, but definitely, uh, don't get too complicated in, in words out of comfort for anybody. Just to kind of say what you're saying. You have to connect as people first. I truly do believe it. That's why I always say, bring your composer and your writer, everybody in the room from the, well, I guess now from comfort of our own homes in the beginning. So we all under understand that this is for the story um, above all. And I think that's going to be the best way to kind of convey that. Awesome. And we've also got um, all this anxiety talk has me wondering, do you ever find yourself prioritizing work on one piece over another because of the emotions they bring up for you? Oh, um, so I'm not really a linear composer where I'm, I say, OK, here's my scene. I'm going to start from this part, from the beginning, then to the middle, then to the end. Um, in school, I definitely was was that kid who was who would do the easiest parts first and save the hardest parts for the end. Um, in music, it does not work that way for me. I have to figure out what the most emotionally taxing scene is going to be kind of first so that I know how to go about what I would consider to be the less emotionally taxing stuff. Um, it's, it's training. I think what you have to do, really, really have to do, is you have to take care of yourself. And, and, and there's so many times when we're writing, we get stuck. Something's not coming out the way we want it to. And we're up for five hours, six hours, 10 hours, 12 hours. 
And I always say this to everybody, when you hit those walls, especially if it has to do with your emotions, because it's an emotionally draining thing to, to really write music, especially under an intense scene. Um, when you start hitting those walls and hitting those points where you're not quite sure where to go, take a break, go to sleep, let the subconscious do the hard work. I always say that because um, you're going to come at it with a much clearer mind um, um, afterward. But there's there's really no trick I think we can do to kind of get around that. I think it's really just understanding where your head is at um, and, and being open and, and communicating with your team. I'm having trouble writing the tune for this part or writing the theme or writing the underscoring for this. Um, there's a lot of stuff happening. Um, and, and always start with something kind of more simplistic. Start with the feeling, get rid of the dialogue, get rid of everything and just start free writing and see what you can kind of pull from that. Awesome. Um, we don't have a ton of time left and we do have a ton of questions. So I'm actually gonna go with a quicker one. Cool. Um, who else in audio drama do you think is crushing it musically? I'm sorry, that totally cut out. Can you ask that one more time? Absolutely. Who else in audio drama do you think is killing it musically? Uh, I think what Travis Vangroff has been doing forever um, has been just undeniably remarkable because he really is just this insane Swiss Army knife of everything. I'm such a huge fan of all of his work that he does, and he, he thinks musically when he's creating even his sound um, 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 as well. It's it's truly, I'm a very, very big fan um, of, what, of what Travis is doing. I'd probably say he's very much at the top of my list. I think what Corey Celeste has done on Return Home and Lighthouse is just so refreshing. Um, and we've talked about this several times, you know, regardless of what, what, what capacity you're building on, whether you have a giant library or small, and she understands human emotions so well, and she's always able to convey um, um, the, the feelings in ways that, that approaches I definitely never would have thought of. And it just helps tell the story, not to mention doing their live performances and, and taking their themes and doing Christmas versions of it. Um, I, I think she truly is, is as a person to really, really look out for. She's doing some incredible work. Uh, and, and, and thinking of it differently than film music, right? Because audio drama music and audio fictions is its own thing. Um, and I think those two are, are clear examples of two people who, who give it the utmost respect for, for what it is and, and, um, and, and how it functions. So. Those are my two favorite composers. I'm gonna I'm gonna give a shout out really quick here to Sam from Marsfall. The Marsfall music has literally made me cry. <laughs> um, like just the music. Um, it's incredible. Uh, there's a there's a really sophisticated use of motifs and foreshadowing and clue dropping, but also this really in depth understanding of the emotion of the scene. Um, and the emotions that that need to be given some support, right? Uh, it, it, honestly, sometimes it feels like a therapy session. So, <laughs> and that's what you want. Yeah. <laughs> Absolutely. All right. Thank you, everyone, so much for coming. Uh, this session is a part of Pod Tales 2020. Three weekends of programming brought to you in partnership with the Sarahs the Sarah Lawrence College International Audio Fiction Award. For a full list of sessions, visit podtails.org. That's P-O-D-T-A-L-E dot O-R-G. And be sure to subscribe Podtails on the podcatcher of your choice to find the podcast showcase selections we'll be featuring from now through the end of the month. As a reminder, Podtails 2020 is completely free. We believe in making the resources we're creating available and accessible to all. If you like what we're doing here, please consider supporting us on Patreon at patreon.com slash podtails. Finally, we'd love to know what you think. You can find a panel feedback form linked both in the YouTube description below and over on the website event page. Please take a moment to fill that out and help us make podtails better in the future.